We are ready. Well, hello, everybody. Can we? Hello. Can you hear me out there so far? Okay, good, good. Um, well, thanks for being here. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. We have a lot of. Whoa! I hear the mics go up. That's perfect. So, uh, looking forward to this discussion. We've got three really interesting people on stage to talk about, as they mentioned, creativity, love, and happiness. Um, and I wanted to start off with a question. It's going to sound subjective, but that's the point of it. I wanted to ask each of you: How do you define happiness? Who wants to start? Yeah. I can begin. I can begin. Yeah. Um, I've come to think of happiness as as. Uh, more of a, not such, so much a destination, but more of a, of a vector. So a, a position, a, a trajectory uh, off of that. So with a velocity and a direction. Um, and that's because I think it's been shown over and over again that we, have a, we may have a, a desired goal in mind, but once we achieve that goal, if we just sustain at that place, uh, we don't necessarily sustain our happiness. It's been shown, excuse me, it's been shown you win the lottery and not that long thereafter, you're still left with the whole that you're trying to fill and so on. So uh, I think that, that that delta and that movement is really critical to it. For me, it's a vector. Sure. Happiness is the journey and the destination. And a number of stops <laughs> along the way. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> well, great. Jacob? Well, I think that happiness is all about, you know, a sort kind of a container to many, many sub-feelings and sub-emotions. And each and every one of us select the emotions he or she wants to it be included in what we call happiness. For some people, being sad is very happy. I know it sounds weird, but that's it. Yeah. Come on. All right. Well, I first, at first I thought it was a warm puppy dog, and then I thought it was an iPhone, and now I'm kind of thinking there's a hole in my heart, like Ethan said, and it might be Web Summit, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that throughout history there's been two theories. One is hedonic pleasure and one is eudaimonic purpose. And I think happiness sits somewhere in between those two, pleasure and purpose. Great. Well, I wanted to start off with that because uh, as, as they mentioned, each of us defines happiness and we seek happiness in different ways. But it's interesting because when you're designing products, whether it's a website or whether it's something more tangible, uh, there's a certain goal in mind to make people feel something. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of curious though because each of the designers have their own definition of this, but each mm. of the recipients or the users have their own definition. So when, when you guys are thinking about uh, concepting a product, whether it's for Google or for Frog or for Chain Sciences, when you're thinking about um, how does this play out, how do you do that when there's so many um, Happiness is so postmodern. How do you factor that into design itself? Mm -hmm. I think there's a challenge, which is that actually a lot of times people are designing or building products not with the goal of generating an emotion, but actually generating an action. And we get lost in that path, um, and we forget that we're actually best off with that emotional state and, and generating the emotion. So we are measuring and this will change, but we're measuring the actions. We're not really measuring the emotions so well right now. Um, and that's really a new technology that's coming up, so that's interesting. The challenge that's inherent in all of this, even as we look toward emotion, is imagining that at each step of the way, it needs to be good, good, and more good, when in fact, often we get the greatest happiness and sense of satisfaction and fulfillment from a more challenging and disrupted path to finally arrive somewhere new. Um, and so how do you feel comfortable with that full emotional journey and bringing somebody back around to a new state which makes them happy, but have them perhaps be displeased along the way? If I may, I think there's a, a huge change lately. I mean, not lately, in the passing 10 years. Um, back in the 90s, there was, a, was there's still a standard for usability. It's called ISO. And the standard defined satisfaction as lack of, of complaints about dissatisfaction. It sounds really funny, but that's the way that satisfaction was defined. And I think they change it and it's keep on changing. I think that um, satisfaction and happiness is now um, divided into much more, uh, dedica um, much more uh, um, delicate uh, uh, emotions and we start measuring them. Actually, you're completely right. I think that more and more UX experts now start to realize and measure emotions as part as measuring the functionality of the application, not only in the design process. Sure. Yeah, well, I think that 
um, in a lot of ways, we've kind of gone through some phases with design, and one has been aimed at, and it's still happening, efficiency, convenience, maybe productivity. And then we kind of moved into this concept of we had one emotion, delight, <laughs> and that was sort of like, woo, party time. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and that's not really sustainable, and it can actually be sort of annoying or tedious sometimes, too, as, as you were both suggesting. And so I think when we're looking to the future of emotion and design, it has to be not even trying to drive people toward a particular emotion, in, in my opinion, I think, because people are going to make their own meaning about what we create. And so I think it's just being aware of it and letting people participate in it. What I worry about with emotion sensing artificial intelligence is that it's going to box us in to say five to seven emotions. And it's based on only one theory about emotions that's from you know quite a few years ago. And there are newer theories coming along that um, challenge it. And so I don't want us to be sort of pigeonholed in, in another sense once we just start getting beyond the light. Yeah, that brings up an interesting point because we, we live in this algorithm society these days, whether it's Facebook or Google or Twitter, and they're giving us more of what they think we want versus maybe what we need or what we want. And so I'm kind of curious, like on, on that train of thought, what does it look like when maybe, maybe one day I'm sad and I'm looking through my Facebook feed and I'm like wishing I were somewhere else or something like that, or I wish I had something else, and the next day I'm really happy, but this algorithm only remembers something from last week. I know you mentioned maybe like from something from like five or seven years ago, but maybe it's over a shorter period of time, and then it kind of funnels in to all of a sudden it's manipulating me to be sadder and sadder or happier and happier. And how do you guys, how do you guys fight against that while at the same time uh, harnessing some of this technology that's coming out there? Well, I think if I could jump in on this one, I think that with artificial intelligence, the huge challenge that we face with all of it, emotion or no, is that it wants us to be like we were before. Um, so it wants us to do more of the things we did in the past so it can sell us things in, in the now, usually. <laughs> um, <laughs> or it wants us to be more like everybody else because that's what it does best, is sort of jam together all of these, in the case of emotion AI, and all the different um, billions of people and their emotions, and like, okay, here's the average, that's what we wanna go for. And I think those are both dangers without people having some agency in that system, I don't, I don't see how it can go to a positive place. Sure. Well, these business models reward bad behavior, because the business models are built for the um, social media companies on the whole are built around uh, advertising revenue. And that advertising revenue is built around eyeballs. Um, and engagement is meant to measure not just the number of eyeballs, but that the eyeballs are actually open. Um, but the correlation of my eyeballs being open with Facebook up and my happiness um, <laughs> is disputable. Right? Yeah. And, and for me, uh, I'm, re I'm really not on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn because it's very functional for me as a, as a business platform, but I'm really not on social media. And, um, and I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm definitely losing something. But on the flip side, for me, going on Facebook and these other platforms feels like talking to somebody on Coke. I mean, they're like, <laughs> they're yeah. talking at me. And in this conversation, there are two people. One person thinks they're super, super intelligent, and the other person is really not sure about that. Yeah. And, and I'm sitting there just being bombarded with information, yeah. um, trying, it feels very desperate to me to keep me there. Uh, and, and, and when it works the most is when I am most resistant to it, and I just want to shut the whole thing down because I get overwhelmed. Um, and so I think we need to move, and, and I don't have the absolute sort of panacea for this, but um, we need to move to business models where there's a little bit more intelligence built into the system and a longer term view of the value of these customers and how they will have different trajectories and levels of engagement over time and emotional arcs. Um, and there's a complexity that we need to be able to acknowledge and, and soon we'll be able to address with technology better. And maybe I'll return to Facebook and others. Yeah. yeah. 
If I may, I think that the people, the, the picture is much more complicated in my humble opinion. People project their emotions over technology the same way the technology evokes emotions within us. For example, I can see, if, uh, you said Facebook or whatever page that I want to see, and you and me will see the exact same page and we feel completely different about that because the situation, the personality, the emotional state that we started with will enable us to project something completely different on the, on the same content. And in this sense, I'm much more optimistic about, you know, the Friday it's about AI and so forth, because human beings will probably will keep on uh, projecting their emotions. And therefore, it will, it's not that easy to manipulate human emotions. It's doable, you can do it, but peop people are letting themselves to be manipulated because they project their emotions. It's give and take a game. Hmm. So what does it look like? So I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of it, just yesterday, um, I, I got an ad um, on, on Facebook. And it said, you know, uh, it was an ad from Facebook. It said, like, you should like something today. Like, like you never know, like, <laughs> what like, like, you never actually, the actual phrase was something along the lines of, like, you'll never know how liking somebody's post will brighten their day. You know, and so it's, <laughs> which is kind of a funny thing right, after, right before this talk. It's very serendipitous. But I'm kind of curious because on, on that note, you know, like, does it mean that we should be more reserved in our emotions to make sure that what we're receiving on, not just Facebook, but any platform, Twitter, Google, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever. Like, so it, it is more of an even keel, um, more of an even pulse, I guess, of emotion? Or, or, or rather, what can users do and what can technologists and creative designers do to try to, um, to innovate with this but also keep it from going too far up or too far down? Yeah, well, I don't know if we, I mean, I don't know if we necessarily want a neutral path, but I do think that um, we don't have enough emotions. So for instance, I'm on Facebook and a friend that I don't know very well, their dog dies. What do I do? I either hit sad emoji, that seems kind of fierce in a way, yeah. <laughs> or, or I write a little comment or something. It kind of, um, I don't know, dehumanizes us in a way when we have a poor amount of choices and we're encouraged to make those choices um, not to help us or to help our community and friends, but just to help Facebook sell ads, right? So yeah. that's like not where we want it to be. Um, and I'm, I think the emotion sensing tech could help us a bit, but I'm afraid that it also has only a, a small emotional range. And when we think about, we're talking a lot about emotion, but happiness isn't just emotion. It's a lot of other stuff too. Like if we look at how, um, say, countries are measuring well-being, they're measuring you know subjective well-being, which is emotion, but also lots of other things. And so that's something we could be looking at. To Ethan's point, I think, and to Jacob's, like, what do we measure next? It might be emotion, but maybe in combination with some other things too. This emotion detection is really interesting, though, because yeah, you've got this this. It, it's just so glib and trite, to, right? To hit the, the sad emoji or I'm so sorry. Um, but then if that came packaged with actually, you know, so I on the rece receiving, I just lost my dog. I'm really bummed. I get your sad emoji. And then it says, actually, Pamela is, that really is sad. Like, yeah. We were yeah, watching her and she's beautiful. actually really sad. Yeah. So, um, or, or it could say, actually, Pamela is, is like stroking her dog and drinking a latte and doesn't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then but, that's but it, friendship there, there's, over. There's, I mean, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're, that's not it, how you were talking about it being deployed, but at the same time, the reality is all sorts of bending of this is, is possible. Yeah. And I don't know that I, I think that, I think that we're, well, I'll speak for myself, I am very manipulable emotionally. I'm, I have a very thin skin. Uh, my three-year-old daughter is totally aware of this. And, <laughs> and as my wife says, she, leads me, so she reads me around, <laughs> leads me around by the nose. Um, and so I think I think there's a real there's a real danger area here that that um, I'm glad that there's so much scrutiny right now for completely other reasons coming onto yeah. these major companies now because I think that there should and will be established um, greater boundaries, controls, and uh, and I think a sense of of ethics and accountability needs to be reinstated um, as we move into this space of not only emotional manipulation but also recognition uh, yeah. and all that that brings. I think it has much to do with the match between what we think 
what we do and what we feel. And it has much to do with this match. For example, for this poor dog example, <laughs> if I feel really sad about someone losing his or her dog, and I really write it down, and, I, and my reaction matches to the event, it will be perceived very well, and it can go even elaborated a little bit more the emoji or less, or less but it will be okay. But if there's a, a gap between these three or one of these three, this is the point, the place where it will feel really, really non-natural and if I may say non-fair because you pushed me to react in a certain way that I didn't want to react, it doesn't match. Hmm. And to build on that, so the emotion sensing technology is going on a theory that our emotions emerge intuitively, naturally from, you know, and they have biological markers, like our heart rate goes up or our blood pressure goes up, or we have a facial expression like, yay, that's, in fact, that's my nightmare that we all have to walk around like this, you know, <laughs> all the time. Yeah. But so. it, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, the latest research has found, um, if you read Lisa Barrett's excellent book about how emotions are made, um, that there, it, there are no reliable neurological markers for most emotions, that it's cultural context, it's our own experience, it's even the words we know to describe emotion. Um, so you bundle all that in and it gets really, really complicated. And so I, I don't know what we do with that, <laughs> but. <laughs> Where I am optimistic though, I'd say, is, is actually yeah. in the application of these emotion sensing technologies in the design research process. Yeah. Um, I'm much more comfortable with people signing up to participate and engage yeah. in product development and improvement and knowing that this is how we're, one of the ways that we're understanding them qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, I'm much less comfortable with the camera on my laptop always yeah. on and not knowing what is sort of passing back and forth information-wise between yeah. me and, and whoever I'm interacting with. Yeah, I agree with that, but we don't, right now, I mean, it's built into uh, iOS, right? They have the facial recognition and they have, they bought Emodiant, and so it's, we're not going to get rid of it, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, I don't know what you said. <laughs> to add on what you said, then, Typically, people think that emotion emerges by, I mean, I feel something, therefore I behave in a certain yeah. way. But in many cases, it's vice versa. You may be going to see a nice movie on the TV or wherever you want to go uh, because you're feeling happy, but you may explain to yourself, you simply decided to go to see a movie, and then you ask yourself, why, subconsciously, of course, why have you gone to see this movie? And you say, oh, it's because I'm happy. So it works both directions. And we have to keep that in mind that functionality evokes emotions the same way that emotions evokes functionality or behavior. Yeah. There's something really positive in that. This, you know, this, this ridiculous, to make it even <laughs> super simple, that, that silly game where everybody lies down on the floor in a sort of crisscross pattern, everybody with their head on somebody else's belly, and one person says ha, and the next person says ha ha, and everybody says that, whatever, and everybody just ends up laughing. We're going to do yeah. that later, guys. I, this is the kind of, the the kind of like yeah. team building moment that I, I, this is very uncomfortable for me, so I, don't ask me to do it. But it works, right? And, and even I will end up laughing. Um, but I think that there is there's something really positive in this notion that that idea that with the power pose before coming on stage or with the <laughs> smile, um, you can make yourselves, we had a high five. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, can, you, can, um, you can push the emotion into your body physically. Um, and I think that that's, that's yeah. there's real opportunity in there. Yeah. And then so, we, oh, go ahead. So, no, sorry, was, go for it. Oh, I was just going to say, and we can feel mixed emotions too, I think to, to Jacob's point there. Like I might be so... Ethan's dog died, and I hit sad emoji, and then the well, emotion dog, sensing said that it was like total BS, and I was, I was just sipping my latte, but I might have really been sad, but I might have at the same time been happy about something else, like maybe, really good you know, latte. yeah, something really, I got a new client, or one of my daughters made me a really cute drawing, or something like that, you know, so it's really complicated to nail those down. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So kind of a, a two-part thing I'm kind of curious about because uh, a couple of you guys have mentioned the, the cultural context that's, that's needed for some of these. And when you're looking at, let's say, like a, like, a, like a big company such as Google, for example, who has users across the world and emotions play out in different ways in different countries, how does that factor into the way that 
a company large that maybe has a lot of data at its disposal builds a product versus maybe a smaller company that maybe just has a small design team that's trying to create something, um, you know, maybe for a, a smaller niche. I don't know who wants to take that, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, small companies can, can get a, a huge leg up in the advantage that a small company has. They may have less data available. They also have just so much less baggage in terms of making uh, iterations on their product and, and going out and learning in the market. And so establishing just a really rapid cycle for them is, is very easy to do. So I think that, that they're using, and this is very fundamental, but the human-centered design approaches that are so common now, which do track sort of an emotional journey in the sort of user experience, um, and using those methods um, with or without emotion-sensing AI um, no, you won't be able to do it as well at scale, but yes, humans are pretty good detectors, um, and through a good qual-quant sort of analysis, you can, you can learn a lot. So I think that there's, they're almost, at the moment, they're, on, they're not on, on equal footing, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity there for the, the young company to learn more faster just through the empirical outreach into the world and testing there. I think, too, there's a suspicion of the larger companies, as we've all seen, I mean, in Europe and the U.S., too. So I think there might be a trust factor there that could benefit smaller companies. They don't have that amount of data. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Keep in mind that smaller companies typically focus on a much focused market. Therefore, this challenge for them is much lower than for big companies. And big companies do make the research around the globe market dependent, I guess, so. Yeah. That's a good point. We, we don't have too much time left, so I wanted to take a second to think about the future here. I know that we've seen recently, so we've we talked a bit about the good and the bad of emotion and design and how those two play off of each other, and I feel like we've seen recently a series of essays, whether it's in The Guardian or on Medium, of, of designers and engineers at these companies that have had a, um, that have had like a revelation that, whoa, like maybe we need to do something more to, to make people aware of how these things work together, um, and maybe we need to do design for good now. Um, I'm kind of curious, how do you three see that playing out? Like, what needs to happen next? And um, it's kind of a lightning round of how might we um, see more change uh, for the better within design and emotion and technology? I think these, these, these people that you're talking about, these contributors, enlisted in a, a, they were enrolled in a, in a purpose, and I think that, that they're very well-intentioned. Um, and they ended up becoming part of a business model more than, than or feel at moments, more driven to be part of a business model um, and a cog in that system as opposed to be um, a contributor to a purpose. And, and I think returning to a clear definition of the purpose at the heart of a company like Facebook, which is independent of what product um, service manifestations there are. It is, it is a North Star to be aimed toward. And checking back against that and publishing that and having a very clear sort of um, uh, centering thought around, around what we're going for. Sorry. Sure. Any last thoughts? Yeah. I think that uh, we have to look on the real world and not only on the application themselves. And it's not me saying that, but I adopt this approach. And I think that if we take our eyes for one second from these little screens that we keep on looking all the time, and see how this application or this service or this whatever we do, do contribute to the real world, something out there of how this technology out there, I think it's doing good. I mean, if there's a match between these two, typically you are doing good and not doing bad. Um, I think that we have had a good run with human-centered design. I think what we need to do is take a cue from well-being, where you have personal well-being nested within collective well-being. So I think where design is going is human-centered, nested in humanity-centered, short view, individual view, long-term societal view together. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have. So thanks to you all for today. Much. All right. Thank thanks. Much. Thank you. you go this way. <laughs>